Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Voikovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Frenchie's Art Gallery, located on historic Oak Street beside the Maple Leaf Bar. With over 3,000 square feet of space, it features a large gallery front room and Frenchie's personal art studio. Frenchie's Art Gallery is also connected to the Maple Leaf Courtyard, which is ideal for the New Orleans night scene. Frenchie's Art Gallery, 8314 Oak Street. Yeah, you're right. Hey, don't forget my pimento cheese. Mario, you I'll take it from here. For the love of palmetto cheese. And welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm your host, Scott Alexander. And we've done 250 of these episodes. And this might be the most special because after 26 months of forced COVID sabbatical, we're back finally. Uh, we had some Delta variants hit when we tried to come back last summer. Then the Omicron variant hit in January. So knock on wood, we're finally back and excited about it. We have a great show for you today. We have John Brady, who's been probably the biggest guest we've had as far as like how many times he's been on the show, former LSU Final Four coach. Also, Tim Floyd, who got his start with the UNO Privateers, one of the first places he coached, and obviously he coached the Chicago Bulls, the New Orleans Hornets, and the USC Trojans, as well as the Iowa State uh, Cyclones, and they had some great runs there. But also Bobby Bear. How about this? The Cajun Cannon is going to be on, and he's going to talk about everything under the sun. You know, all you got to do is turn on the key, and that guy will just roll. I cannot wait for this show, but let's get into what's going on right now. The Saints. Hey, listen, after the offseason, you lost some players. You know, you, you finished 9-8 and eight ha after having the best record in the NFL for the previous four seasons. Well, look at this. They, at Saints rookie camp. They, they featured two first-round picks. Chris Olave, who was moved up to the 11th pick. The Saints moved up just to get this guy. He's going to be the game-break speed guy to pair up with Michael Thomas, who was just the NFL's Offensive Player of the Year just three seasons ago in 2019. And also you're going to get Jarvis Landry, who had the most catches in NFL history starting the season. And they also drafted this guy, Trevor Penning, who is going to replace Teron Armstead at left tackle to be paired up with Ryan Ramchek. But let's get to the Pelicans. How about this team and what they've done? During the playoffs, this guy emerged right here towards the end of the season. You know his name. Brandon Ingram became a true superstar in this league. And then you paired him up with the midseason trade for C.J. McCollum from Portland to give that backcourt leadership that this team has sorely needed. And when you team that up with Zion Williamson possibly coming back next season, this team is going to be serious and have a very bright future. It's going to be fun to watch. Also, draft lottery is tonight. And because of the Lakers implosion this season, this, the Pelicans were able to keep a top 10 pick. And it's likely going to be 8 or 9 percentage-wise. But there's a 6% chance, just like the year they got Zion, that they could get the first overall pick. We have a great show for you today. I cannot wait. Once again, it is John Brady, Tim Floyd, and the Cajun Cannon, the father of the Houdat Nation, Bobby Bear, right here on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Hey, 
Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports, and I can't think of a better guest after 26 months to have as my very first one, and you know him well, the founding father of the Houdat Nation, the Cajun Cannon, Bobby Bear, the first winning quarterback in the history of the New Orleans Saints, and here he is, no stranger to the show. Welcome back, my friend. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, I'm glad you're back in the saddle. Finally, huh? Finally, all this COVID stuff, and uh, well, you're back in the saddle. This is your wheelhouse, and... Uh, you know, you and I go way back, way yeah. back. You're talking about the 90s. Uh, the Atlanta the Atlanta Falcon days. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. And then uh, you always took care of me because, you know, uh, with those Hawks uh, tickets. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I never forget, uh, boy, and T-Bob still remembers this, when you took him to the locker room to see Shaq. Now, he was like four or five years old. I think Kobe it, was a young player, too, yeah, at that time. Right, Shaq was at uh, the Orlando Magic. That how, that's how far that goes. Right, right, right. That's right. The Magic yeah. days, and then again in the Laker days. I know you, both your boys love basketball. Both were great football players as well. As far as you, though, man, I have had the best time the past year working with you at WWL Radio. I mean, getting to see this guy every day is a treat. If you're not around Bobby Bear, it's probably exactly like you think it would be. But it's, it's so a lot better off the camera. Though. Much uh, better uh, off. Uh, yeah, yeah. All, all the stuff the that mic, goes on in between. Mic, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the commercial breaks, yeah. We, we should be uh, recording this. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> exactly, you, right? you have to worry about what you can get away with. So, so how, how's that transition been, man? I know, I know you started in, in the media in Atlanta when you left and we yeah. were hanging a little bit back then and then you came home to New Orleans obviously you're you're a Louisianian you're a New Orleans Saint guy even though you did go to the Falcons but right. the fact is you're in the media here and uh, you have that fine line of being former player and you have to ask tough questions what's that been like for you well uh, I'm gonna be like you're at you know the bar having a drink or you're in the living room watching the game and just have a conversation and uh, I might interrupt when you're talking but the, the, then a lot of people do that in general. Come on, you can't be half stepping. You got to be able to bring it. You got to be quick with it. <laughs> One day, I don't know. I've had 11 concussions. Uh, I might be drooling and maybe can't even make a sentence. Uh, but, but but I look at it. Hey, you have fun. I've been doing this now uh, post football career uh, 24 years. So wow. seven wow. in Atlanta. Wow. Now it came right before Katrina. That's I've been doing this uh, for 17 years. So time is flying by, and I feel like why. Uh, it works here in New Orleans. I grew up 50 miles south in New Orleans on Bayou Lafourche, right? And always had a great relationship with the great uh, Buddy DiLiberto, you know, with Buddy D. And Buddy D uh, was inviting me to come back and uh, to be a part and to help him. Uh, you know, he's on the radio to help him with um, the draft, uh, with training camp, the pregame, postgame, and then he passed away. And then it all of a sudden became a full-time uh, gig. You became the next Buddy D. Yeah, I became the next Buddy D. And I think the fans can relate because uh, they feel like I'm one of them. You know, when I ran away, it's like the wayward son coming home and, and stuff. So, and, and they understand. You play long enough in the NFL uh, or any sport, you are like a hired gun. You are a mercenary. And that was my situation. So to be able to come back home, no, I lived in Atlanta 14 years and I hated it. Right. It's too I was much there 19. I was too there much damn traffic. It's horrible. I mean, it's horrible. I, I don't listen. If I'm going to drive 14 miles, I don't want it to take 50 minutes. Certainly. I mean, then you just stressed out. Especially the older I get, I don't want to be involved with that's that. That's the last five years. I couldn't. <laughs> I just was just, uh, hatching escape plans. But yeah, I mean, for my career, it was great. But you did something that was interesting. What you did. You went from here. You were a hero, man. I mean, four playoff games, or I don't know if you were part of all of them, but the fact is, is the Saints had no winning records. I grew up uptown. I mean, Tulane Stadium was around the corner right. for me. We used to, like, cry every Sunday. Five and nine was a reason for a parade back then when there was a 14-game schedule. You came in, all of a sudden this team is going through strike year, 12 and three. I mean, you guys were winning right. regularly going to the playoffs. And then, you, you you know, you didn't get that contract you wanted from Finks. Yep. You sat out. You did the right thing. You paved the way for a lot of guys. I know it was hard for you to do, but you didn't cave in. And tell me well, how that Well, just a hard-headed Cajun. Yeah, I tell mean, me how that You got a hard-headed old school general manager, hard-headed Cajun. I said, I'm not giving in. I, I, I told Mr. Finks here one time, I don't know. I got 12000 a month to live off of after taxes. I can live in a freaking trailer. Uh, I, I go, come on. Uh, you try to play hardball with me, but I'm going to do it what's right. right. But coming here uh, with the Saints in 87, uh, you know, winning 12 games. We won nine games in a row. I know, the I know. great Archie Manning, the, the best they ever went was 8-8. Eight and eight. So we won nine games in a row in 1987. 
Uh, twice I was part of teams. We won 12 games. Uh, we were 11 and 5. Uh, we were 10 and 6 in 1988 because they had less wild card teams. We were 10 and 6 and didn't make the playoffs. What do we I say today? That year. If you get the 10 wins, right. you're in the playoffs. With 17. Games. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no matter what. But and then in 1990, it was just my contract was up. I said, how can somebody own you if you don't have a contract? And so I just played hardball. I, I was trying to become the first million-dollar player for the Saints as far as the regular season, you know, the salary. Right, right. And the Dawn Patrol, they're all on my side, and, and it, it drove Mr. Finks crazy. And the one thing I never forget, that's when, you know, I played football where you still could smoke, at, like, at halftime. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, till 1985, 86, you'd have players at halftime, and they're like all sweating, and they're smoking cigarettes. And it's like, now you can, you know, can you think about funny. that? You That's can't funny. even smoke well, inside. And then Mr. Finks, here he was like a, a, a chain smoker. So I, I never forget, you know, uh, you get to the wife, you get to the player. He's trying to get my wife and say, I know what's in best interest of Bobby. And, you know, she was a college gymnast and all that. And she goes, well, he's not going to tell me anything about gymnastics. So I'm not going to guide him about uh, his football career. And Mr. Finks, well, he just took it on that cigarette. He's just, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's desperate when he's lighting one with the other one, <laughs> right, right, right. and he's keeping it going. And then I did a little bit of homework, and this really got him mad. He goes, "Well, Mr. Fink, I said, Mr. Finks, I always called him Mr. Finks, because always respect my elders." You said Mr. Rat Fink behind his back. No, though, no, right? but, but right. his face, I never called him Jim. I always called him Mr. Finks. Right. I respect my elders and stuff, and uh, I never forget. I did a little homework. I go, Mr. Finks. I go, you know, management's not always right. And he kind of looked at me. I said, for instance, look at your situation. The Pittsburgh Steelers, think about this, cut Johnny Unitas and kept you. <laughs> and he was like, you son of a, he was like looking at me. He had to walk out and go, and go take a lap. But think about. I didn't even before, know that story. That's before, funny. Before Joe Montana, who, who was the great, well, arguably greatest quarterback? Johnny, Johnny United. United. Johnny United. We all right. know what he did with the Baltimore right. Colts. Right. But I'm telling you, That's the, the, the Steelers cut Johnny United and kept Jim Finks. <laughs> I don't think he took kind of that. That's why you were Atlanta <laughs> Falcon right after yeah. that, right? So, uh, real quick, as far as those, those days, what's your best memory? I've never even asked you that, and I know it's a cliche question, but I've never asked you. What's your, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of that time with the Saints? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, uh, when, when uh, going to the playoffs, because all oh, the Saints will never go to the playoffs. They'll never that go to the playoffs. So I moment. think, now, now, Sean Payton and Drew Brees has told me this, uh, you know, uh, look, but they achieved this unbelievable. Uh, you talk about greatness. Uh, sure. that, that was, that's, yeah, I mean, now, I think, I don't, I'm not saying but the underachieved. For, for our era, going to the playoffs yeah. was the, the Shangri-La promised land. The Mecca. Yeah, because you gave, mean, the, you gave the fans hope. Right. You got to have hope. So, uh, you know, Sean and Drew said, look, y'all established that, the Dome Patrol and all that in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, where the fans had hope. Then they had a lull until, uh, you know, Sean Payton and Drew Brees came on board. But I would say g gone in the playoffs. And the one thing that, to me, and I was like, say, man, I'm glad it worked out. Because you want to always be able to come back home, right? And if you want to, especially in Louisiana, if you're from Louisiana, a lot of times you, you were born here, you live here, and you die here. I was gone for 29 uh, years. Okay, back, but yeah. you always uh, come back. Right. I almost in 1985, after the USFL, uh, signed with the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was going to Seattle. I said, well, if it doesn't work out in Seattle and I suck, I mean, I can leave Seattle. No, right. no, no, nobody will know. But I said, <laughs> That's my favorite picture of all time, by the way. That's when y'all were on a nine-game win streak. But you, you see, I think <laughs> my tooth. That's not even my real tooth. That's not a gun. I know, I know. I know. Was... Knocked out and, and, but, but that was a huge moment right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. You were on national TV with Jimmy the Greek and the whole thing. Jimmy the Greek came right. down by Lafouche, and they were right. playing Boo Ray at, at Chalala's and Galliano. And I all. loved it. I mean, so it got a, a, a lot of exposure. So to be a, a, a part of all that, and uh, the one thing I said, boy, when I, if I go to the Saints, God, I said, J just, just help me be a winner. And you know, you're praying, and you don't ask it too much, because uh, I never forget, we were playing the Eagles one time, and uh, the great Reggie White, the all-time sack leader, 
Man, he knocked the crap out of me. I'm telling you, my eyes were crossed on the ground, and, and, and he's coming to pick me up, and he tells me, Jesus loves you. And, and I'm like, That's a sign. And, and I said, What if he was really mad? That, that dude could kill me. Right, right, right. And so right. I started thinking, you know, he prayed, Oh, God, help me. We got to win. Uh, you know, but they got Christians on both sides. Who is God going to honor? So I just said, Well, if I come back to New Orleans and, and I can at least win, because if you don't win, they want to hang you by the, uh, the, the, the nearest tree or, or haul you in a wagon downtown and throw tomatoes at you. But it's the and, greatest and place if you do win. If you do win, exactly. They accept you, and I was just glad I was a part I of it. i got to talk about this year's team, but i got to mention one thing first. You mentioned Archie Manning. I remember in 78 and 79 when they did go 7 and 9 and then 8 and 8. Yeah. We were cabbage patching in junior <laughs> high for two straight years because that team, we are like, and then when y'all came around and started really winning, I mean, the city was upside down. But the first show that we were going to have after 18 months of COVID, I was coming back last July, and I'd set this show up for like three months. And literally with Drew Brees, it was like almost a year with his agent, Chris Stewart. Right. I had all set up for two months in advance, you, Archie, and Drew Brees, the three greatest quarterbacks in the, the world. The three States amigos. Sisters, who had never been interviewed together. Right. And I remember I worked this thing so long, and then remember the Delta variant hit like five days before. And, uh, you know, obviously your father passed away of COVID. I mean, it was yeah. a big thing. I wasn't even going to attempt to but, do But that. let me tell you, I'm not, not, not going to make light of this because, uh, hey, you have to look at life. And right. understand that's how my dad was, the, 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 uh, the, the, the joie de vie, the, the joy of life. Joy of life, right. I mean, you have to. Here's my dad. He said, we all, my dad would say this statement. He was the first 100 people to die in Louisiana in COVID March 27th, 2020. You know, if you would have told him, he said, well, we're all going to die anyway. And I said, uh, he, and he's like, I'm right with God, you know, and then how in his viewpoint, he said, boy, I really went out with a bang. My dad would have been so excited. He was on ESPN for two days. <laughs> they mentioned his name for two days, and then he made the New York Times. My, my dad would have looked at that like, oh, what? Uh, what I, didn't, I didn't have just a normal death. I mean, I'm on ESPN and New York Times. What, so. what a wonderful <laughs> way to look at life right there. Uh, no, that's I what mean, he told him. And, uh, and, and on his deathbed, yeah. he was singing, uh, uh, and the only one who got to be with him, I talked to him on the phone, was my nephew who got the Medal of Valor in, in Afghanistan in the Marines. Okay? Wow. And Micah was there with him. Uh, my middle brother, Benji's son, Micah, and he was saying on his deathbed, you know, trying to breathe and sing, he, he was singing Amazing Grace in French. Well, Bobby, I can already well, tell you. And I'm like, that gives me goosebumps. You're going to have to come well, back that's for another show. that's a lot of hope show. right there. You're going to have to come back for another show. Cause, well, I can tell we're not even going to get to this year's Saints team. <laughs> yeah. Because I, there's two things I want to get to you before. I got Tim Floyd and John Brady, and I've never had yeah. Tim Floyd in the show. But here, the one thing I do want to get to you is your passion for the city, for the Saints, for the fans. You truly love them. And I have a couple shots of you at the Dome oh. leading some cheers. And this is vintage Bobby, man. Bobby's getting after it. And the next one, the next one they're going to show, that face right there, that is oh, your that, passion. That, I'm getting goosebumps. That's the Who That Nation chant. You know, before the game, you go, Who That? And yeah. hear all the crowd saying, it. Boy, I had that. In French, you say frissons, like goosebumps. Right, right. Man, I, I walked off right there after doing that cheer. I had like tears in my eyes. I was there. I, I was mean, so fired I, up. I, I was like, all I know is if you're in a fight, you want me on your side. I mean, I don't know if we're going to win, <laughs> but I know I'm going to bring it. I love this. All dude. right. <laughs> I'm not done with you yet. I just love what you just said. Hey, Coach O, you two have gone way back. You know, oh, that's another show. Junior high. High school state champions. You upset Tommy Wilcox and Bonneville. You upset John Forcade and Shaw. Y'all pulled it off. Y'all been lifelong friends. He tried it out at LSU. He ended up leaving, going, joining you at Northwestern State up in uh, Natchitoches. Natchitoches. And you guys were roommates up there. And now you guys have been friends for life. Yep. And you've been there through the good times, right? And some of the bad times is too. Uh, but the fact is, is that I worked with you all last year and Ed, was interviewed all year at once a week and even after the season boy he's a lot more fun after the season when he was gone right right <laughs> but the fact is is that it was it was it was impressive and kind of hard to watch that you had to ask those hard questions to a guy that you love so close and at first you were throwing softballs early in the year right but then it got to be where you were like how hard was that because you were hitting well, them some stuff that you had to say but it was I can't imagine saying that to one of my best friends well because uh, listen, you can't be thin skin right. uh, and, and like like I told coach o, I mean and I feel sorry for you when we were living together in a, in a football dorm when they had football dorms in 1980 
I said, if we can look at a crystal ball, okay, and you're talking about like uh, 40 years later, or whatever, and you could say, you know what, boy, this is going to happen to you. You're going to have arguably, if not the greatest season that's in the conversation in college football history, beating seven out of top ten nationally ranked teams. Oh my God. And, and, and you're the head coach. Okay, nobody can take that away from you, and you're national champions. And then you got a multi-million dollar deal, and they're paying you $17 million to go away? I'll take it. Well, what? I said, look, I'm sorry for you. I remember Jim Kelly uh, telling me, you know, the old Buffalo Bills quarterback, and, and he was like, no, pressure and anxiety is when you got about seven or eight mouths to feed, and you just got laid off at, 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 like, at the steel factory. What? Now that's stress, and that's when you can have sympathy. I said, sympathy? No, uh, Coach O is going to resurface. He's tough, and, um, and, and he can handle it. So the only thing I, I knew, and we were laughing at, he did kind of jam me. When I did ask a couple of tough questions, you know, we leave it, and he'd say, all right, Coach A. Bear. All right. <laughs> that's his name. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Coach A. Bear. Okay, Coach A. Bear. There's a lot of other stories we cannot tell, which I've oh. also heard. We'll just get to that another yeah. day. But, hey, you have to come back and talk Saints now because I spent three hours getting pictures and video of every position on this team, but I had a feeling that it might go this direction, which I'm very glad it did. Well, Scott, we always uh, do our pre-training camp show. Yes. So uh, yes, yes, uh, if yes. you have me on, I'll, I'll come back late July. That's perfect. That's perfect. And um, talk about the same. Because there's a lot of hope. I'm telling you, we are not just home cooking. Uh, I'm telling you, the Saints. Uh, I, oh, I got to bring this up. Yeah. L listen to this, uh, who that nation. We have more LSU flavor now that Sean Payton's gone. <laughs> and the only reason why I can figure this out. I remember this kind of irked Sean Payton. Remember we had Scholar Green from the West Bank. Yeah. Now he was very talented and fast. But Sean's taking the approach. Why does the media want to talk to him all the time? He's not even going to make the team. Or he's barely on the team. So there's but, some of the guys you're talking about. But, yeah, Honey Badger. But, but huh? now, having Honey Badger, Tyron Matthew, and Jarvis, Jarvis Landry, Landry, you know what's the closest thing? When I played, we had Eric Martin and yeah, Dalton Hill. I said that too. Oh, uh, Eric Martin and Dalton Hill. We have that they LSU They started their careers now. there, and these guys are ending yep. their careers hopefully there. So that, yep. the, those are two of the best of all time you play with, and these are two of the greatest LSU players ever too, certainly of this era. So that's going to be fun to watch. Well, and, and I'm thinking right now for sure uh, double-digit wins. It's not I'm, I'm 100% and, 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 and I have, I've been defending this on Twitter. I hate to even do this because I hate getting Twitter things. But I think Falcon we're in the top three to... NFC teams. I'm I, right I, I think we're right, right there. there. The AFC strong, I'm but we're right now, there. Top third at every single position. I'm not talking about offensive guard. I'm talking about offensive line. I'm not talking about defensive tackle. I'm talking about defensive line, linebacker, secondary, running backs, wide receiver. Uh, and I'm not counting tight end yet. Although yeah, yeah, Jason yeah. could end up being great. Top third at each of those positions other than quarterback in the entire NFL. Tate. Well, the, the, the pressure's on Jameis Winston. Yeah. is no excuse. And I think uh, he's going to uh, uh, The only reason why the Saints don't get to double-digit uh, wins uh, is Jameis Winston's struggles. That's it. That's if it. Jameis Winston plays good, it's, it, it, you can have a 10-win season. If he plays great, I think they get to 11-12 wins. He had wins. zero weapons last year. He yeah. had Marquez Callaway, who I love. He lives in my building. Number one receiver, number two receiver was uh, Deontay Harris, who's a punt returner, and then you had Trey Quan. And you Smith, got Marquez Callaway is now the fourth guy, and then Trey Quan Smith. He might not even make the team now or the competition. First of all, Michael Thomas, Jarvis Landry, and the first round pick you uh, moved up to get all the way to 11, Chris Olave. I love it. It's going to be special. I got to go. I got to right. give these guys some time. By all the way, right. I always give you shirts and gift certificates for restaurants, and I'll get you the restaurants. This is Task Performance. You know him well. How oh, soft yeah. Is that oh, feel? God. It feels so good. Oh, I, this is so, the material is so nice. I, it's ridiculous. If, if you want to sleep in it. I mean, well, I tried it on nine years ago. I never I haven't taken it off at, at all. At Drew Brees. Mickey Loomis, they all wear. I love you, Bobby. Take all right. Care. Thank we'll you, Scott. You all right. Who that? That was Bobby A. Bear, the founding father of the Who Dad Nation and the Cajun Can, of course. But coming up next, you know my favorite sports basketball, and I've got two of my favorites. First, we're going to start off with Tim Floyd, the former New Orleans Hornet coach, the former UNO privateer coach, and a lot of places in between. And also after that, we're going to have his buddy John Brady, who is a frequent guest of the show, join us. I can't wait. Stay tuned right here on Primetime Sports. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. All right, let's roll, let's rock. 
rock and roll Baby, do the rock and roll At Mid-City Lane's the home of rock and roll The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachaise a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachaise, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Cheese. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports of the Cajun Cannon. How fun to see. But I can't wait for my next guest. I mean, this is a first time guest for me here at Primetime Sports, and his name is Tim Floyd. You know him well. If you're an old time basketball fan, you remember the success he had with the UNO Privateers in the 80s and early 90s. Two NCAA tournament bids right there. They went to the NIT three times. In six years, he went five postseasons, including one year they were undefeated in conference, and the rest of his resume speaks for itself. I remember at Iowa State, I did games with Tim Brando. That team was a top five team in the country. They had all kinds of talent with Fred Hoiberg, Marcus Pfizer, Dedrick Willoughby, the list goes on and on. And then we keep going, and he, he coached the Chicago Bulls right after Michael Jordan and that group left. Obviously, he came over here later and ended up being the Hornets coach, but in between that, he was at USC and did some great things over there. Maybe it was right after that. But regardless, he brought Iowa State and USC, I can factually say this, to their best records or most wins of all time at that time when he got there. Tim Floyd, good welcome to, to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to have you, yeah, buddy. Good to be here. So let's take you back. Okay. One of the things I've noticed, uh, and I, you don't even know I'm about to say this, because I, I saw you and Archie Manning at a game. And it was a Chicago Bulls game, and the Pelicans were getting hammered. And they were not – They, it's a turning point in the season, honestly. And I remember seeing you all at the game, and I happened to be behind the Bulls bench right before where you would leave if you were, like, going into the locker room. And I remember it was, like, an 18-point game with seven minutes to go, and the Pels were losing. And you all left to beat the traffic. I mean, it's <laughs> a bad right. game. That's right. And I'm going to tell you this. It was the, one of the greatest comebacks I've ever seen, certainly making up that amount of points in the fourth quarter. And the season turned around, and then that's when they went on their run. They ended up sweeping the Portland Trailblazers in the first round. So I credit you and Archie every time <laughs> for being the good luck charm for the Finally leaving that game. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I, first of all, I've got to be a masochist for being at, at that game because right. both those teams, the Pels right. and the Bulls, fired me. Right, right, exactly. What, what am I doing exactly. sitting there? So why would I stay for the entire right, game? Right, 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 right. Let me get out of here. You know, you start having flashbacks. I did not even think about that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I am thinking about is your relationship with Archie Manning because I know yeah. you all are close. And mm -hmm. Archie is obviously a legend here. He was originally going to be on the show. Uh, but I'm going to say this. And I remember when I found out why or how you met, mm -hmm. it just it had a eureka moment. But I'd rather you tell the story. How did you meet Archie Manning, and, and how did you all become such close friends? Well, um, I, I was a ball boy, uh, really washed jocks and socks Love it. For, for the New Orleans Saints. They trained in my hometown of Hattiesburg in 1971, which was Archie's rookie year. That's where they had training camp? That's right. Okay. Yeah, they, they were there. And uh, anyhow, my father died. Uh, that year and Eddie Jones who I loved was the business manager of the Saints and Dan Simmons one of my greatest friends of all time uh, after my father died they sent flowers told me I had to go to Vero Beach with them that the Saints just couldn't survive without me being a ball boy <laughs> the Saints, which was so great of them you know I mean I was 16 years old so anyhow um, ended up staying with the Saints for six years and Archie was a rookie all the way through his sixth year so I was 16, and then all of a sudden I'm 21, and uh, you know I was a kid, yeah. and and, um, and he was doing his deal and 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 a star, and so 
Uh, I come back in, uh, let's see, I'm 34 years old, 1988, to coach the, the privateers. The privateers, right, right. And one of the first phone calls I get is from Archie Manning. I thought, how cool is this? You know, Archie remembers the old A uh, New Orleans ball. legend, yeah, I mean, yeah, come on, yeah. he's still a young and, man, uh, relatively. And, and Archie, being the kind of guy he is, says, what can we do to help you? Uh, what do you need? Outstanding. And, and so I said, well, by the way, we, we need complimentary hotel rooms for our recruits. We need some Royal Oldsmobile. We, we need courtesy cars <laughs> right. for our coaches. And everything just gets done. And then it was summer jobs, et cetera. And uh, wow. had a chance to, to be around he and his family more during those six years. And then, uh, you know, I've been fired a time or two through the years. And every, sure. time we, every time we get whacked, we come back to New Orleans. And um, Every time we get whacked. <laughs> there's a family right there. You can see some pictures of them. What, what a yeah, yeah. just remarkable yeah. family. The first, certainly the first family of New Orleans, certainly yeah. when it comes to sports. But... Well, your relationship you, with that family well, in general. Well, I will see, the, the point is this. Archie treated me as a 16-year-old kid, yeah. as he did when I was coaching the New Orleans Hornets or, or the Chicago Bulls. Uh, he was the same person, same guy. And, um, and I've always appreciated that and valued that. Well, I mean, I'm going to say this. It was fun having Tim Brando brought Archie into TV for a while. I mean, obviously, he was doing the radio here, and then he, they were doing preseason games. And that's when I got to know him back in the, the late 90s the early 2000s but then then those guys were doing national stuff on CBS during the half times of uh, you know the SEC stuff so Archie's uh, imprint is certainly wide and long but as far as your career people don't remember this but people might know the movie Glory Road right Don Haskins the great win Texas Western 1966 national champions when they beat Kentucky with Pat Riley Larry Conley Louis Dampier and that, that yeah, group yeah. so you ended up one of your first coaching jobs, if not your first real co assistant coaching job, was with Don Haskins in El Paso with UTEP, right? That's right. That's, that's really where I got started. You don't uh, want to hear that story. I, I started working there in 1977, was yeah. there until 1986. That's a long time. Yeah, he, he was really the only guy I ever worked for and uh, taught me everything that I knew about the game. And, and I had such great, great respect for him that I never really deviated a great deal from the things that, that he valued that he taught me. But uh, it was a great experience. He was known as the coach that broke really the color barrier no in, the, in the South. Uh, first coach to start five African-American players. And uh, that team, Texas Western, ended up beating Kentucky in the national finals, which were all white. And, uh, and, and really, the, the significance of Coach Haskins in that team, he, he probably got 30,000 hate letters. Right. As a result no of that, no doubt. Of, of winning that game, and and, uh, and and the next year, Kentucky signed an African American player. They signed Tom Payne. Tom Payne. But the board of trustees at, at Kentucky knew that they couldn't just have a black player because they said, "Who's he going to date?" And they were worried about that player maybe dating wow. their white daughters. Wow. Wow. So they had to bring African American girls into the University of Kentucky, and then. Alabama followed, and then Auburn followed, and, and the entire South started integrating. The entire Southwestern Conference was not integrated at the time. That's so, pretty amazing. So this man was an incredible, incredible man, and, uh, and he, just, he, he just started the guys that he thought could help him win. He said it wasn't about black or white. He said, I'm just trying to win games, and they happened to be his five best players. But, That's pretty amazing. But prior, prior to that time, the, the old rule in basketball was that you could start uh, – uh, two black players at home, you could start three on the road, and you could play four if you were behind. <laughs> and, uh, and he just kind of threw all that out and uh, was, a, was a great, great uh, influence on my life. That's an interesting rule, though. I'm never going to forget that one. Yeah. Hey, you came to New Orleans, okay? Mm -hmm. What made you come here? I mean, I, I'm sure you, you were maybe looking at options. I don't know if you had any besides this, but I imagine you were at Idaho. You did very well. Uh, when you came to New Orleans, which is kind of home, like you said, what made you uh, come here and stay here for so long? Because you were here for six years. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, they'd had 23 basketball coaches in in 84 years of basketball at the University of Idaho. Uh, they, they had had nine they've winning... They've had 23 since then, I think. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they had, they'd had nine winning seasons in those 83 years of basketball. So 
I knew that I couldn't buy a cemetery plot in, in <laughs> Moscow, Idaho. That, that I love how you happen. said it right. You yeah. coach there. Most people say Moscow, but it's Moscow, right? It's Moscow. I learned right. that at the press conference. Uh, yeah. I got corrected yeah. and lambasted for calling it uh, Moscow. Sure. Yeah, but uh, but anyhow, it, that, that was a great opportunity for me at that time to go there. Nobody wanted to hire me, and I had an opportunity to, to, to become a head coach. Uh, and then coming down here... Um, was just an incredible thing because in basketball the urban jobs are the best jobs. You look at Louisville, Cincinnati, right Marquette, yeah. DePaul, UCLA. Um, if, if you're in a city, you should have an opportunity to win. Get players, and, right? Uh, and there's just players everywhere. And and so uh, Coach Mace, who is one of my dear friends to this day, the greatest athletic director that I ever worked for. Imagine this: the only AD or general manager that I ever worked for that would walk in my office once a week and say, look, I may not be able to help you, but I want to try. What can I do to help you? Wow. You know, imagine that. That's I mean, mystery? Yeah. And that, that what should a be. tremendous man, by the way. Well, that, that should be AD 101 right. class. That's Thank what you. you do. You know? You and, hired and, me. And he had to tell me. me no quite a bit, you right. know? But uh, just a great, great guy. In fact, I've got the peer at our lake house south of Poplarville named Maestri Field because as I you recall that. after Katrina they were going to take UNO and make them division three yes yes and Mace got ticked off his name was on the field and he said look you're talking about rebuilding New Orleans and making it bigger and better than ever and right. everything's going to be bigger and better except for you want to make our program division three take my name off the field so I went and got a big sign I love and I got it, it on, the, on the pier and he's out there fishing all the time I got to come out there and fish yeah. on Maestri Field <laughs> so hey uh, everybody has defining mm -hmm. moments in their career that may change their life a little bit you know mm -hmm. our buddy John Brady uh, obviously got to that sweet 16 beating Duke and then beating Texas to go to the final four it's a life changer but mm -hmm. he had a guy named Darryl Mitchell hit a shot that was a little bit improbable that stayed in the air for about 20 seconds and beat Texas A&M just to get to that Sweet 16. I'll go to Rick Pitino. If Bob, Billy Donovan doesn't hit a shot in the Elite Eight to go to the Final Four for Providence when he was coaching them uh, and gets you know here in New Orleans in that dome we're looking right here behind you to play you know that Indiana Syracuse Final Four. Um, maybe he's not the coach of the Knicks and maybe he's not Rick Pitino, right? Yeah, yeah. In your case, it may be a little bit different, but I've heard you say this in an interview, that when you got Irvin Johnson, not the Magic Johnson, but the Irvin Johnson pictured right there, that was a life changer for you as far as a player that you got under an incredible circumstance, which I know you've said before, but talk about what having that meant for the rest of your career. Well, it, it did. It, 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 it changed the trajectory of where we were going. It gave us an opportunity to win, and it was... Uh, it was a God thing, you know, just it it's really was. Yeah. It, it, it was. Uh, now, I, I want to preface this by saying the first great thing that happened here at the University of New Orleans was a guy named Melvin Simon yes. signing with us from the West Bank. Top five recruit, I believe, in the country? I yeah, mean, he was, yeah, big, he was right? top five. It was Georgetown who was getting all the New Orleans yes, players. Yes. Um, you know, North Carolina, Perry Kentucky, McDonald, that group all up there, right? LSU, LSU. Right. And LSU had Shaq and Stanley Roberts. So that was a great thing. His mother, Martha, still the all-time mom of all time for, awesome. for trusting us. But, but anyhow, um, there was an article written in the Times-Picayune um, going into my first year. We had had nine guys on the roster and nobody over six foot four inches on the team. We had, we had replaced Art Tullis who'd won 21 games and they had, had gotten rid of their top seven players. We're all seniors. Liddell, Eccles, Ronnie yes. Grandison. Yeah. So the players were gone. We got the job late. And um, and so I love this article because it was a sympathy article. Give the new guy a chance, you know. <laughs> give, give him a chance. Uh, small <laughs> right in the country. Anymore. So uh, liquor salesman from New Orleans was in Baton Rouge, and he walked into a grocery store in Baton Rouge, and uh, there was a six foot eleven guy sacking groceries, and it was Irvin Johnson, and uh, all tall guys get the same question: sure. Where did you play? Right. And he said, Well, I've never played. He said, Well, have you been to college? He said. No, I've never been to college. He said, why haven't you played? He said, well, I worked in, uh, in this grocery store the last three years because uh, there was nothing else to do. I left Jonesville. And, and uh, he said, well, go, go talk to the coach at UNO if you're talk, tired of sacking groceries. So he walked in my office the night before National Signing Date in November, and we were calling every tall guy in America. This is crazy. 1988. I didn't know the details of this. Yeah, yeah. So we're calling every tall guy in the country and getting no, no, no. Uh, got to sign guys the next day. 
And this, he was seven foot at the time, walks through the door and he, and he says, hi. I said, yeah, what can I help you with? He said, I'd like to play for you. And uh, I thought, well, this has got to be a joke, you know. I said, he's one of those old New Orleans Saints guys. You I'd know, like to play that, for you. He just walked through yeah, the door. Yeah, yeah. Because any, anybody wants to walk on, they're usually 5'8". Yeah, it's and, guys like and, me. You know, they got like, well, I'm you know. Tall and 5'8". Yeah, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, and and uh, like, you, know, you just can't, can't play. But so seven foot is the first time this ever happened. So I'm thinking it's a joke. One of the old New Orleans Saints has set me up. Sure. So I look out the window to see if there's any strange cars parked there. It's 9 o'clock at night. No, nobody there. So I said, okay, what's your name? And he said, Irvin Johnson. And then you really think it's a joke. Well, that's got to be a joke. It's got to be a joke. So, Magic. So I made him show me his driver's license, and it was Irvin Johnson. And that's I said, why are you here? And he tells me the story. And I said, uh, okay, so why have you never played? And he said, well, I was six foot two in high school. And I played the tuba in the band in high school. That's and crazy. I, and I, and I never, never played. I grew after I got out. And I thought, well, you know, um, we can't get anybody, and maybe we can teach the guy how to play a little bit. So I do something I probably wasn't supposed to do in the time because you couldn't try him out then. You can now. But I take him back in the gym in, in the old practice facility, and I said, okay, I'm going to throw you a ball and uh, show me a hook shot. He, he says, what, what's a hook shot? Doesn't know what a pivot foot is. Oh my goodness. But I said, okay, let's do this. Let me see you run from inline to inline. And he could just run like a deer. I said, okay, we'll do this, we'll do this. I said, now, if I'm crazy enough to do this, I need you here tomorrow, because we got to start getting a head start. This was November, and we're going to enroll in January, but we got to start working yet. He said, I can't do that. I said, okay, this guy doesn't get it. He, he doesn't get it. And, uh, you know, he doesn't understand work ethic. He, I said, why can't you do it? He said, I've been working at this A&P for three years. I've got to give my boss a two-week notice. Oh, and my God. What a, what a huh? integrity. I mean, Think come about on. that. that I didn't have a guy you, on my team that, that would have done that. tells you everything you yeah, need to know. Yeah. But uh, came in, worked really hard academically. He had, to, he had to do that. Ended up graduating on time in four years. His first college game was at Memphis. He had 14 rebounds in the game. We wouldn't throw him the ball. We just told him, if you get the ball and you can dunk it off the offensive board, dunk it. If not, throw it back out and get to the corner. I'm going to save some more UNO stuff when John comes on because John Brady, who ended up coaching, obviously, LSU and others. And, uh, and Irvin Johnson. And Irvin Johnson. I want to get right. that. But I have to ask you this. The Chicago Bulls thing, and I'm only going to go one thing. It's not that what, what happened there. It's yeah. what, how did you get so close to the situation that they had to have you. Because I remember hearing your name, you know, I was living in Atlanta at the time. I was working NBA circles. I was, mm -hmm. what you don't know, besides our, we have a light in common, as both of our fathers died when we were teenagers, but I was covering the Bulls with Craig Sager from 96, 97, 98. I did every playoff game, like every single one. I saw the Rock Star show that was. Yeah. It was amazing. We did home and road. Mm -hmm. And um, in every locker room. I, I know mm -hmm. that United Center like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. um, but. Your name was always brought up, man. I mean, mm -hmm. I had done games with Brando at Iowa State, and that's where I met you mm -hmm. when you had Hoiberg in that group. But mm -hmm. I was like, man, this guy, they love Tim Floyd. But how did that happen? How did you become such a force in that organization as far as like a rumor, and then it became actuality? I, I knew I was going to be the next head coach of the Chicago Bulls 10 years before I took the job. <laughs> That's Think crazy. about that. Think about that. Before Doug Collins had it even, or right around that time? Because no, Doug it, had it, then it was, Phil got it. It was, it was uh, after Doug. Here, uh, what happened was the small team at UNO, the small team. Irvin redshirted that first year, did not play on that team. That small team with a 6'4 center, 6'3 power forward, and, and uh, a 6'2 small forward and two 5'10 guards. Um, we ended up being good. We ended up being good. And, and – uh, the general manager, Jerry Krauss of the Chicago Bulls, was scouting a guy named Randy White at Louisiana Tech. Yes. Louis First he, round pick. 6'9", 250 lottery pick. Mavericks, right? He went to watch him three times. He thought he was going to be the next Carl Malone. Then happened. So all three times he watched him play, they played the University of New Orleans, and we beat them all three times. And they had Randy White, and they had 6'11", P.J. Brown on the team. Great player. So they had big guys. Oh, yeah, wow. But Jerry just wasn't smart enough to know that small guys could beat big guys and and and, and big guys can't guard small guys right? big guys can't guard they small can't. guys but small guys can guard big guys right and and our uh our, our guards were really 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 good players and so he walked up to me after 
our conference tournament final game, and that team would have gone to the NCAA tournament too, but but we uh, could not get a bid because it was a new league. And he said, um, I'm Jerry Krause from Chicago Bulls. I know who your old boss is, Don Haskins, and I just want to let you know, I've watched you play three times, and you're going to be our next head coach of the Chicago Bulls. Wow. And I thought, I thought well, that's, <coughs> that's really nice, and I just kind of blew it off like, you know, like sure. And then he started calling me. That's how it happened. Started calling me like once a week and telling me he wanted me to put the triangle in, which I never would do. I never liked the triangle. Right. Uh, but I had to run it when I was you there. You Michael Jordan with the triangle. Doesn't <laughs> yeah, that help? It looked, it looked better. With <laughs> yeah. Scotty, Michael, yeah. I don't know. Things looked better. He started inviting me to, to camps, training camps, which I'd never go. And then that'd be weird, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I thought so too. But he he didn't want. I, I certainly did not want it public. Right. And I told him not never to make it public because I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it. And it got I real needed, public in '98. I promise you. And, and, I, and I needed to recruit. Right. You know, I needed to recruit. I needed yeah. to worry about our right. teams and yeah. our jobs. Because other other schools are going to recruit against you if they say, yeah. "Hey, he's going to the Bulls," right? Yeah. And then Jerry started calling. You know, more and more and more. And uh, and he actually. Uh, was going to blow the team up in 96. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is when they beat Seattle with uh, Hersey Hawkins and Sean there. Kemp. And, yeah. and Gary Payton and Detlef Shrimp. And, yeah. yeah. They had me fly up to Chicago and meet Jerry Reinsdorf for the first time and walk around under the guise that I was there to see Irvin Johnson. My guy from the grocery store was starting for the Seattle oh Super Size. This is all the subterfuge yeah. going on yeah. right there. Yeah. So, so anyhow, um, we, uh, we met and then I told uh, the owner, I said, this is not the right time to do this. You need to let this die its own natural death. Yes. Um, and Krauss was really upset. He wanted to. He wanted to blow it up right then. And uh, see, don't you think there's a little ego there? With Jerry, with Jerry. that situation with Krauss feeling like. Well, I think anybody <coughs> at that level, you know, anybody at that level's got some ego. Right. And, so, and, and I call it pride and confidence. Right. But, but no, Jerry, I, Jerry I agree really believed. I agree with what you just said. Yeah. Confidence. You know, and, and Jerry really believed that. You know, and, and and to give him credit, he had put those teams together. No doubt. And he felt like he could go do it again. And there's no doubt you're right yeah. because they, they, he needs to get credit for that. Yeah, but but um, you know, and Jerry wanted to get rid of Pippen and all those guys when he could still get value back. Right, that's the key. That that yeah. was the key. Yeah. There. But but anyhow, the owner, um, you know, I told him I said this thing needs to die its own natural death. I said, these guys are the Beatles. Well, that's when you got the job. And back then, yeah. cellular service was only nine ninety nine a month. So <laughs> that was a good deal. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah. But, but that time, and we're going to get to, I have to have you on another show. It could be a year from now. But yeah. I got to get you because I want to talk about the New Orleans Hornets experience. You know, your USC and just yeah. your playing experience. I mean, heck, I mean, you you were, you were with your dad, right, at Southern Miss? And then no, no. He'd I, already I, passed yeah, away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And then you went on to, to, to uh, Louisiana Tech, Louisiana Tech yeah. right? But I was no good. So we don't really need to talk about my, my playing experience. John no, Brady no already good. said that. Yeah. But I don't, but I don't look, agree But with look, you. I was better than Brady. Brady played Division Two ball, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Brady's off camera if you can't tell by now. By the way, since you're a first-time guest, we, we have like <laughs> – 20, well, not 20, but at least a dozen of these okay, balls. Sure. That's how long we've been doing this. Well, but it looks like I was an afterthought right. with all these autographs. <laughs> you just are that hard to get, man. Find me a good, maybe that right there is a good right spot. There? Sign, okay. sign it big so I can see your name in the future. We're going to keep okay. you on here and bring my man uh, John Brady on. I also have a task shirt for you, but I'll give that to you next segment. John Brady's going to come on. They coach together at UNO. Uh, with Irvin Johnson, we're going to talk about some of those stories. I cannot wait. John is easily the guy that I've had on this show more than any other. In fact, one year I think he was a, a, a co-host for <laughs> at least about 12 straight shows because he was my basketball analyst. But that's coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. Sundays at 6.30 p.m. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports, and I cannot wait once again. I haven't had this guy on in at least 26 months. I know he was on about a month before COVID hit. You know him well. He was my co-host during basketball season. We did a lot of, uh, you know, point counterpoints on the college game and some NBA as well. But he's going to join Tim Floyd, and he's Tim Floyd's former assistant coach at UNO. You know him well, former, former, former Final Four coach at LSU, John Brady. And what's up, man? It has been a minute. Hey, I'm glad you're Lots back, Lots of things brother. going on. 
It's Glad you're back. It's good to have, to have you back, you back here, man. I had to have you. I miss tuning you in. <laughs> I miss tuning you in. I'm glad to be back, so I'll have you. Oh, hey, hey Coach hey, Floyd. You guys <laughs> right here. I've, I've been watching you over there from Let's afar. Up the hump. <laughs> yeah. He wants hey, to get... reminds me of old times. I'm sitting next to my boss. I miss <laughs> <laughs> He never listened to me then. I'm going to listen to me now either. I think there's a large portion of this audience that has no idea that y'all actually coached together for a bit there. And That's so, right. can you tell us how that came about? Let's start with let's start with you first of all, because you're the guy that had to okay the hire, right? Uh, did you hire him personally? Well, uh, John and I really kind of knew of each other growing up. He was in Macomb. I think he idolized my career. And had his <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's don't go there. I, I said, yeah, Tim and I knew of each other. When we played, he'd sit and watch me play. That's kind of, that's kind of what I used to say. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we I love each other. This is getting off to a good start. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and he ended up at, at uh, Mississippi State with two guys that had worked for me. They were all working together. Kermit Davis, yes. coach at Ole Miss now, and Larry Eustacey, yes. who had gone to Iowa State. and they, But they had all started there together. Yeah. So we all kind of knew of each other, and they'd all talk about Brady. But uh, how did it all happen? I don't know. Well, what, what happened was you, you had hired Ken Burmeister That's right. to, to take, I forget who left, uh, your staff at UNO. And, and uh, so Larry told you, he said, you, Ask Brady. He may come down there with you. Yeah. And so I'd been with, with, with Richard Williams at Mississippi State for eight years, and I was never going to get that job because that's where he was going. Like you said, he's going to dig his grave there. That, that was his, yeah, that's his, that's his place. Right. That's, that's his calling. So he's going to stay there forever. So I couldn't advance there. So I had to move to maybe come back or do something else. Yeah. And, and Tim, Tim was hot down here at UNO and good guy, and I knew him. And so I, and, and Burmeister at just left. He stayed here for about a month. He what? stayed here for four days. Yeah, four days. That must yeah. have been hard to work for. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, but he left and you yeah. called me. He went to DePaul. And I came down here yeah. and uh, because I knew you would move, and I'm not saying I was ever promised a job, but there was an opportunity. I knew Tim was going to go somewhere, and if I stayed there and we did a good job, right? Uh, you know, who knows? You might, might become be the head coach here. Yeah, might be he, the head he coach, head coach here. Yeah, which was fine with me at the time. And so I came down here, and, and Tim actually paid me more than I was making at Mississippi State. Wasn't a, I'm not talking about a lot of money. Hey. But at no. that time, it was it was good. And, you got $5 and, uh, an hour. Yeah. And so <laughs> I came in here and worked camp. And, you know, and then one thing led to another. They'd already signed Melvin. Simon was coming in as That's a freshman. Big time. That was Ir big time. Irvin Johnson had been here. Yeah. Had, had a guy named Tank, Tank Collins, the best 6'5 player I've ever been around. Or I've ever coached. Yeah. yeah. And, and all of a sudden, we win 17 straight games. We finished that season ranked like 18th in the country in the final AP poll. There was a lot of pride in New Orleans, and I think uh, that might have been around the death penalty, or I think or maybe they could just come back from Tulane, Tulane coming back. Tulane was rocking in. Though. We played them in a game during Mardi Gras at Tulane Gym. Yes, a I remember that. Yes. Game. Triple overtime. Yes, triple overtime. They were trying to call timeout, didn't have any, and then the, the the official backed off of it because the player and Perry Clark told them they were calling a play. Right. Yeah, this was a play. Yeah, yeah, they were out of out of timeouts. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, I'm gonna get upset again <laughs> all over again. Yeah, we'd have won the dead gun game in I regulation. Know. That's absolutely. exactly what happened. It was it was a wild affair. Perry Clark told him that that was a yeah. play call. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was not a timeout. That's right. Yeah, a play right. call. We're supposed to be a shooting play, two, that's a, we're supposed that's be shooting two free throws with no time, and it's over. That's right. You, you, go, you go through Tulane's practice facility. A picture of that game is is on 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 their wall. The, the two lane players are up on the, the, the scores table celebrating. Yeah. It was unbelievable. That, yeah. It, was a, it was a great, great environment, great game. I mean, it was, it was, hey, it was can, can I give you a little follow up on this Burmeister thing? He left and went to DePaul. Okay. Right, yeah. But when he came down here to interview, we went to a restaurant over here uh, on St. Charles, and I got a parking ticket. <laughs> and, and, okay. And, and uh, uh, no, worse than that, my car got towed. That's what had got towed. Went down to the tow place, and I, I parked in a legal spot, and, and so I got no money. You know, I mean, we weren't making any money, and yeah. and so I, I don't want to pay this seventy-five dollars to get my car. And this lady kept saying, "Sir, if you want your car, pay the seventy-five. I said, "Look, I want to talk to somebody and feel this thing." And we go back and forth. I mean, we're at we're at it, 
So look, that fall, you're on the staff. You remember this story? The best point guard in the entire South is right here in New Orleans, Pointer Williams. Pointer Williams. Pointer Williams. Okay. I, okay, he ends up, I'll tell you why, what happened. I, I, go over to, I, I go over to make the home visit, knock on the door, come to the door, and his mother was the lady I was going at over the, oh over the towing goodness, ticket, that's going crazy. back and forth. Oh okay, God. so she looks at me and she says, "I know you from somewhere." And I said, "They don't." I said, mm, "I don't know." <laughs> I said, "Maybe TV or whatever." She said, "Have you ever gotten your car towed before?" I went, "Absolutely not." <laughs> 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 that's when it's one time it's okay to tell a white lie. That's when you know this might not work. <laughs> I said, we're down here. Yeah. What are the odds? Who's second best player? <laughs> that's so, pretty darn funny, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of like, and I'm going to say this, because as your first time, I asked this to Bobby, and I don't usually ask this, but when you think about your time at UNO, John, what's your biggest memory? That game or is there another one? Oh, there, there, were, there were several. Uh, and I'm talking one, about on the it, court and not after the no, game. I got it. Look, <laughs> right. This game in particular, uh, we're playing at Virginia. They're seventh or eighth in the country, somewhere like that. They had a great team. We go up there with Irvin and Melvin, and we beat Virginia at oh my Virginia. God. Wow. And Tim is running off the court. And he puts his arms around my neck, and Floyd says, "We just beat the Cavaliers." <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, That's a pretty funny I memory. I don't know if I, I love it. I don't know if I ought to tell this story or not. But, Go ahead, tell. You know, Let's get in there. Tim, 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 I was that was the best nine months of my life because I stayed here nine months, then I went to to Sanford as the head coach, got right. the head coaching job. Right, it was so great. Too. Turned out being a good thing, but you know, Tim was had this idea: we need to go play a road game. In Memphis, we went to play uh, some team up in Memphis. Maybe uh, it was a, it was a not Memphis Christian State. school or oh. uh, uh, ambassadors was, or somebody. Uh, uh, yeah, it oh. was a it was a like an FCA kind yeah, of FCA AAU. Team. Like tra- athletes in action. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a travel. It was a traveling team. We were going to play an exhibition game. Yeah, nobody's ever done this before. We're going to play our exhibition game on the road to teach our players how to travel. You know, and all that because. You don't ever experience that. So we, we play an exhibition game on the road. Because we want to go learn how to win on the road when right. we get into the yeah. season. Go yeah, go with but the routine. You got to go beat the whole those routine, Christians. pre-game meal, yeah. warm-ups. So we, we come back in the locker room, and, and Tim says, okay, guys. I, I don't know going? where this is going. I mean, says, Tim I, says, I hope he goes, this is what we're going to do. He <laughs> says, we're, we're going we're gonna to say the Lord's Prayer before we go out and play. So we all get up there together, and Irvin Johnson's the greatest guy ever. So we're all up there, and Tim says, our father, and Everybody repeats, our father, after Tim. <laughs> Tim gets in about the second verse and everything goes quiet. And Tim says, heck, Irvin, I forgot the words. Take over. <laughs> Take over. Yeah. Take over. <laughs> so, hey, so, win, so Irvin Johnson goes right through it. <laughs> I don't I, remember that. That, that, that did not happen. Well, well, and then when I walked out, I said, what have I got myself into? I was an altar boy, okay? <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Wait, you, had, you were thinking about the game. We can put him on the spot again, okay. Johnny. Yeah, yeah, okay. Tell me about other things. <laughs> he was thinking about that game. He had a tough matchup. I understand the pressure of that. I do remember that. That's kind of embarrassing. That's, <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be like, like wedding vows. He's like, <laughs> I have to repeat them. Thanks, thanks for bringing it up, John. I, have, I obviously know i got to get both of y'all back again because I'm out. Best nine months of my life when I worked for him. And, and he, he, he goes back to the old school, like what he and I believe in, a couple other buddies, I, Coach Eustachie, Kermit, uh, you know, defend it. What a great treat, by the way, you guys Get have. back in transition defense. Yeah. Don't give up easy baskets. Take good shots. That's kind of how we all tried to coach it, and it, it will still work to this day if somebody would do it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how good those nine months were because I've been around him pretty regularly for six years. And, and I'm going to tell you what, I feel like the, I felt y'all coached for five years because I've heard so many stories about those nine months. I'm almost shocked that's all it was because well, he, he cherishes that time. Well, I grew as a coach, too, with John because John, you know, had that great background with Bob Boyd like Larry and Kermit did yeah. every time I, you know, Got around him. I grew, and uh, he, well, you know, he takes them to the Final Four. I never got a team to the Final Four, and he reminds me of it every <laughs> dead young time I see him, you know. Hey, Will, so. do you want both these guys on this ball? You want both of them? 
Just break because he can't sign LSU ball. It's just John. John, you didn't sign anything. You signed every other ball, so yeah, take that one. John, right, my friend. And uh, hey, got it. And I got I got a shirt for you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> task performance, John. Well, I got some others for you. I got some oh, new colors, but I got a drawer full. There's one, and I get you another one too. You take that. Is that right? That's a beautiful, beautiful. color. Got so that is task. By the way, I got to thank a lot of people. Alex and Logan well, in nice. there. And of course, my producer Will Hill. It's so good to be back. It really is. It's where I got started here, and uh, you know I expanded. But it's good to be get back to your roots, and of course, Jim and Ron, uh, who run the station. But it's been a fun show, and I can't wait for next week now. I feel like I'm back in the saddle, and uh, thank you for watching. I'll be back right next week on Primetime Sports.